Welcome to Home Gym History, produced by Garage Gym Radio. My name is Rob, and I love vintage weights. And tonight, we're going to focus in on what has shaped the home gym, arguably as much as the barbell or any other piece of equipment, the power rack. Joining me is Jake and Adam. How's it going, guys? It's great. Glad to be here. It's going well. Yeah, glad to be back. Nice. Well, you're both... No stranger to power racks, squat racks, various gym equipment. I heard recently on a Garage Gym Experiment podcast episode about your first equipment that you had. Jake, you were talking about a rickety bench. And Adam, I, you know, I don't want to offend you, but I forget right now off the top of my head. What was your first? The um, My first like piece of equipment. Yeah. Did you have a bench? Did you have a rack? What did you get? Barbell plates and like a ladder style $200 nice. rack. Yep. There you go. So just, you know, something to try to lift out of. I had a bench similar to Jake's situation. And the reason I mention all this, I mean, it might be confusing the listener, like, wait a minute, I thought this was the history of Power Racks, is that in the evolution, in the progression of a home gym, Power Rack is inherently something that, you know, was invented for the purpose of use at home, not the other way around. And although those cheap benches that some of us experienced or those ladder style stands that you experienced, Adam, crept into the game thanks to some modern uh, changes in strength games and in lifting. We've seen a resurgence of the power rack. So that's what we'll be covering here. To start out with the history of the power rack, let's think about the home gym. So Bob Peoples, he invented the power rack, at least according to the Stark Center, which I've mentioned before at the University of Texas. And Bob Peoples invented it, much like other inventions, out of necessity. So to give you a little background, gentlemen, Bob Peoples was born in 1910 in Tennessee. And Paul Anderson, a famous strongman and lifter, was his friend. He was his one-time pupil. Bob Peoples coached him for a little while. And when asked about his training, Bob said, Over the years, I've trained outside and in various (laughs) outbuildings on our farm anywhere. In fact, I could set up a small lifting platform. So just imagine that in your heads there, listeners. I mean, this guy's just, he's finding what he can. He's setting up lifting platforms outside on the farm. And then he goes on to say, and this is coming from Dr. Al Thomas's Iron Game History article from the Stark Center as well. Peoples goes on to say, in 1946, we moved to our present home, and I have a gym in the basement that Paul Anderson has always referred to as the dungeon. Do you guys have a name? For your gym, I mean, Jake, do you just go by Garage Gym Experiment Gym? (laughs) Yeah, I've never really had a name for it. But there's plenty out there of people who are naming their their gym something like the Dungeon. Sure. How about you, Adam? Uh, When I had a garage gym at one point, people would come over and lift and call it the Pit. Last name's Pitman. Well, that kind of worked. I love it. That actually, I mean, this is serendipitous. That ties into where we're headed with this because the Dungeon was quite literally a pit like he dug it out of his dirt basement so i'll show you a picture in just a minute but let me talk about training so when or how you know did bob peoples start to train in a fashion that would require him to invent the power rack well when asked about this he said i was also able to locate a copy of physical culture magazine and read through all the articles on weightlifting Mark Berry's strength magazines were also available, and later I discovered Strength and Health and Iron Man magazines. So these magazines, long before being able to just purchase a program to do at home, or even, you know, Juggernaut AI or any of the, you know, interactive things, long before having a, you know, a coach that you send videos to since you lift at home, there were these magazines, and there still are magazines, such as Strength and Health, published by York, and Iron Man magazine, amongst many others, that would then have different articles, different pieces of advice, and as Peoples mentioned, that's how he figured out how to lift. But the key here is that he said, following some of these systems, I began to refine and develop my individual methods and equipment. So when it comes to your lifting, gentlemen, you know, How did you first learn about it? I doubt you like had any, well, I I guess I shouldn't say that. Maybe you were very advanced at a young age of 12 or 13, whenever you started lifting. 
How'd you figure out how to lift? Did you just trial and error? Did you have a teacher? Did you have a program to follow, a VHS tape? Uh, I personally didn't start lifting until I was a freshman in high school. I just so happened to be on the same football team as Adam here. So <laughs> I'm guessing we, we pretty much started around the same time at the same place playing football. Yeah, similar. Uh, when my oldest brother started playing, my dad would take him to the gym. The gym that went, they went to was pretty big bodybuilding gym. And so he started mm-hmm. bringing us and I was around like some pretty, pretty big bodybuilders for the area and just kind of <laughs> watching and learning and stuff like that. So Nice. So, you know, you had some, some uh, role models, if you will. You had some people around, you had family members, you had teammates, you had a coach, you had someone to teach you how. That wasn't the case with Peoples. He's out there on the farm. <laughs> so he does have friends, though, like Paul Anderson that I mentioned. Well, these inventions are where we really take off and we work our way into the genius of Bob Peoples. So for just a second here, let me tell you another quote from him. He says, my first weightlifting apparatus was made with a one and one quarter inch bar and some wooden drums on the end. The Stark Center calls this the Peoples deadlift bar. Let me show you a picture of it. So this is the Peoples deadlift bar. And check it out. There's the bar. And then in order to... You know, load on the weight. He had these barrels on the end of it. And if you notice and you look at the top of it, and for those of you that are listening on Spotify or on Apple, basically it looks like you know wooden slats in a barrel formation on either end of a bar. But at the top of it, there's an opening. And that's because he would load them up with rocks. So as I said before, this dude, he's just doing what he has to do to lift some weights. Now... Keeping with that, he invented some other things. He's a big dude. That dude's a monster. Here's a little younger picture of him, but take a stab at this and describe for the viewers, Adam and Jake, what do you think he's inventing here? Safety squat bar. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Awesome. Now, there's some debate as to that, whether, I mean, he's the true inventor of the safety squat bar, and maybe that's another episode of Home Gym History for us to explore. But undoubtedly, he made a version of it out on the farm you know for those of you listening rather than watching he's got a bar on his back it's in a looks like a i don't know a high par position maybe low bar not sure on that and those stance that he's in but what i am sure of is that he's got these slats coming down the front of him and he's holding it right near the sides of his chest effectively a safety squat bar let's take a look at this next invention if we look at this you'll see that he's got wrapped around his wrists some cloth it looks like and then some hooks well this plays into the power rack and into the lift that bod peoples was known for the most the deadlift in order to train past his grip strength he started using these hooks now we have straps we have various other things we actually do have hook like devices you can use but at the time out on the farm this is how he devised getting around limitations of grip strength and continuing the pool now adam it's time to see the original pit so why don't you do the honors and tell the people listening what you see there in this picture. Oh, man, it's beautiful. Um, it looks <laughs> like, uh, oh, uh, you described it well. So at the bottom of his basement, dirt floor, it looks like he dug down at least eight feet. And he's got like a squat stand in the back, the barrel deadlift, a couple other bars. Yeah. Oh, oh man, that makes me nervous for the foundation of his house, but. Yeah, Yeah, just a literal pit just dug in his basement. Absolutely. So he basically drifted along, in his own words, until 1937. And then at that point, he had made some lifts that were subpar as a middleweight in his viewing. And he was unhappy with the results. And he decided, you know what? I've got to change my game up. I've got to do something more. So in an Iron Man 1952 article, he says, I set up two posts in the ground and I bored holes through them in such a way that I could load a bar up and finish at deadlift height. From this, I would take the loaded bar and do dead hang lifts, which I found to be of great value in developing the deadlift. So this is where the invention of the power rack comes about. It's actually not for squatting, at least the first invented power rack, and I'm sure he did squat in it, but he invented it for various deadlift motions And looking at the picture here, you're right, Adam, we've got some plates. He eventually had a Jackson set that, oh boy, I'd love to get my hands on that. And the right side of this 
photograph. You can see some of those deep dish. You can see them on the bar. And then he still brought down that good old rock-loaded barrel deadlift bar. He's not giving up on Old Faithful there. There's even some bars up in the top of the rack, if you look. And as you said, it looks a little bit like a squat stand. But the reason it's considered the first power rack is that the putting of the bars into the wall for which the bar to rest on the way a modern power rack would have. And the Stark Center actually has those wooden slats and actually has that set up from his dirt basement. So to show you a picture here, this is another shot at the top. And what we see here is globe dumbbell and various barbells sitting around in that basement. And it was winter, by the way, that inspired him to do this as well, because in the wintertime, he wanted to be inside. And even though it was a deep, dark basement with some wooden slats on the floor that was dug out of rock and dirt, it was better than being outside. And there's Bob Peoples deadlifting outside of the rack, but all the same, deadlifting in his home gym. Now, as far as how he deadlifted, in that rack and the kinds of things that he did, well, he was becoming one of the best deadlifters of his era. So to quickly kind of give him some respect for his deadlifting prowess, just to list through, in 1940, he hit 600 pounds. And then at a Tennessee state meet in 1946, he pulled a whopping 651 pounds at a body weight of 175 for a world record at the time. Now, 1947, so keep this in mind, this is one year later, he pulls the unheard of, for the time, 700 pounds. So let's just, you know, internalize that for a minute. I know we live in a very Instagram, TikTokian day and age where, you know, it's seemingly everyone and their mother is pulling 700 pounds. I'm not. I mean, my goodness. Not at all. Not even close. But every time I look on there, I'm like, who's this person? And how are they pulling that much weight? Well, back there in the 1940s, 700 pounds was an unimaginable amount and he put almost 50 pounds on his deadlift in one year. That's also amazing to me. And he pulled it, but then check this out. So he pulls the 700 pounds. Yay, you know, everyone's happy. It's in Chattanooga, Tennessee, near his hometown. I should mention that he's, you know, in Tennessee. That's what I'm talking about, the winters and whatnot. And then after the fact, it's told to him, hey, uh, actually, Mr. Peoples, we just weighed everything. It's 699. <laughs> and... <laughs> But according to Paul Anderson, his friend who was there, you know, and legendary lifter that maybe we'll cover in a future home gym history, Peoples wasn't really annoyed by any of this oversight. And in fact, the cameraman, to add like salt to the wound, comes up to him and says, hey, Bob, uh, I missed it. <laughs> so not only is his 700 pound like lift actually 699, but then he's told, hey, I missed it. Well, with a smile on his face, Bob said, OK, and lifted it a second time. For the camera so you can google it i'll try to drop an image of it here the shot of it but the background story i think is phenomenal that he's like sure i'll i'll set another i'll pull it again i mean can you name some recent world records of deadlifts you have any idea guys just the i mean the one that sticks out was the the covid 501 kilos by half thor yeah there you go half thor i mean how about you yeah. Dick? I mean, the number 1,000 kind of, like, feels like 700 back in the day. Andy Bolton? The way you're describing it, yeah. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to set aside Andy Bolton because he might have actually pulled it a second time. But And I don't mean to insult Half Thor, but when I think about some of the humongous deadlifts of our recent modern time, like Half Thor pulling 501, Eddie Hall, I mean, there's now come out information Eddie Hall has talked about how, like, he almost died, he he couldn't he was blind for a period of time after pulling 500 and all respect to eddie hall because previous to that the record was in like the 460s in terms of the record that he broke so that was a huge jump to hit 500 but i'm just pointing out that i really can't imagine within minutes eddie hall or hathor walking back to the bar and saying oh it's all right turn on the camera i'll do it again like, no problem. I got this. <laughs> now, the reason I say Andy Bolton might be different. Have either of you guys ever read The World's Fittest Book by Ross Edgley? No. Okay. So, this book I enjoyed. It's He basically 
he goes around the world doing different things. But this isn't a book review. What it is is basically a little bit of information I remembered from Andy Bolton in this book because Ross Edgley actually went and trained with Andy Bolton, the world's first 1,000-pound deadlift. And I know we're getting a little off track here, and hopefully we'll have a future episode just about the deadlift. But since we're talking about it, let me just tell you that Andy Bolton said that for 19 years, all my life had been geared to that moment. Even when I wasn't training for it, I was living it, eating for it, studying for it. I even thought about it in my sleep. If I didn't make that lift, it would have almost not made sense to me. I was so sure I was going to do it. No one, not one doubt ever entered my head. So when I stood there in front of everyone with 1,003 pounds in my hand, it just felt normal. So that's where, to pay a little respect, hearing that, I got to say, maybe Andy Bolton would have pulled it a second time. I mean, he did go on to pull even heavier. Now, back to Bob Peoples, back to the power rack, back on track, using that rack for deadlifts. Have you guys used your power racks for deadlifts? Or do you usually lift in front of it? Do you use it for different things? How do you use it? I've used it for deadlifts for, like, uh, rack pulls, just setting the bar, like, high thigh, doing uh, above max weight and just pulling high. I haven't done it in a while, but I used to um, use the rack to, like, easily change out the weights. So put it at the bottom setting, put it down, and then change out the weights like that. Yeah, before we had the... Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Clever build. I love my clever build. Not affiliated with them or anything, but man, I love this thing. So yeah, before we had an easy home gym innovation like the clever build, and I mean, there were others before the clever build. They just did it really well, in my opinion. Yeah, doing something like that in Iraq, you know, to just help load it up. Adam, you hit on rack pools. Well, Bob Peoples, he's the man. He's in there. What he described is basically a rack pool. But here's some other things that he did. So he would do what he called the hopper deadlift. And this one will make anyone who really loves, like, the knurling on their bar and can't imagine it getting scratched up kind of cringe. So a hopper deadlift was where you basically, you're doing a rack pull, but then Bob says you lower the bar fast enough to get a really good rebound, quote-unquote, from the steel bar of the rack. And he called it the hopper deadlifts. Now, from a lifting perspective, I mean, I'm not a trainer. I don't... You know, claim to be an expert from these things, but I would just guess, and guys, correct me if I'm wrong, that the benefit there is you're putting on heavier weight than you can pull, but you're getting a little bit of an assist. It's almost like a banded exercise in a way. You're getting that little bit of assist. But out there on the farm, seemingly alone in that dungeon, as Paul Anderson called it, Bob was just figuring this out, that, hey, if I really slam this sucker hard enough, I can lift a little more, especially in the high position. So he said, going on, like I mentioned, the power rack wasn't just for deadlifting. Quote, unquote, he said, I also use this setup for the deep knee bend, which essentially is a squat. And he says, you can set the supporting bars at any height and do almost all the power lifts known, such as half deadlifts, half squats, half supine presses, short pull cleans or snatches, and a lot of other too numerous to mention. And that comes from that Ironman article. So now... Moving forward from Bob Peoples, moving into like the production of these things, you know, not just a guy with some wooden posts in his basement. Any idea about power racks um, before, we'll say, Rogue? Rogue came about in 2007 and arguably produces, if not the most, probably the most of high quality power racks. Um, what do you think, guys? What do you remember? I lifted at a gym that had some pretty beat equipment and. The, the big ladder style squat rack is what always sticks out to me. It was all rusted up, you know, just step ladder down. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know years, but I'm guessing most of the, the hammer strength racks mm. may have been before Rogue. I had a podcast with someone from Stray Dog. Mm-hmm. They mentioned how they had some power racks back in the day as well. Um, but other than that, I don't know much about when they first started. Yeah, I heard that one with Jake from Stray Dog, and, um, you know, I don't mean to insult any other companies by mentioning Rogue as a benchmark, but I feel like in the home gym scene, Rogue certainly played a part, at least in my opinion, with, you know, supplying for CrossFit and with the popularity of gearing things towards not just, you know, universities, commercial gyms, but gearing things towards a home gym owner and having a rack in your home gym that there was a resurgence. But I do remember hearing that. And um, when it comes to things, 
long before any of that, and I would argue long before Stray Dog Strength, too, in the 1960s. So when we were talking, we were talking 1940s into the 50s for Bob Peoples. Well, in the 1960s, Terry Todd, Dr. Terry Todd that I've mentioned before, Stark Center, and Craig Whitehead, they popularized the power rack because they were working on this whole theory they had of maximum fatigue. And, I mean, think about it. In a home gym, for me personally, when I bought my power rack, it was like, oh, I'm not going to die. Like, <laughs> I will live another day. I, I can push myself to complete failure if I want to, and I have these beautiful straps that will catch the bar. So that's where it came into play. And Terry Todd actually ties in to Bob Peoples and became very good friends with him, weirdly enough, because he was the one, after 15 years, that record that Bob Peoples set, after 15 years, Terry Todd was the one who broke it. So in addition to being a scholar, I mean, Terry Todd was first a power lifter. So he broke the record in 1965. And in a 1992 Iron Game History article about the passing of Bob Peoples, that's when Peoples passed away, Todd recalls, and I quote, Finally, in 1965, in a meet in Tennessee, I managed to hoist 730 pounds, breaking by five pounds the record Bob had held for more than 15 years. But the fact that I outweighed him by well over 100 pounds and had an inside job that allowed me plenty of time to train left no doubt in my mind or in anyone else's that I wasn't in his league as a deadlifter when everything was taken into consideration. I spoke to Bob shortly after I had made the record to thank him for his inspiration to tell him I knew he wasn't, I wasn't in his class, and he seemed to appreciate it. <coughs> so, Dr. Todd, reaching out, paying some respect to the people that came before him in the same way we try to do here on Home Gym History. So, moving on from there, we have people like the original West Side Barbell. So, when you hear West Side Barbell, what do you think of, guys? Reverse Hyper. Oh, yeah. Louis Simmons. Reverse Hyper, the original drink spotter. Yeah. So, Louis Simmons, West Side Barbell, Columbus, but the original West Side Barbell was actually by Bill Peanuts West. So, Zach Evanesh, he has a podcast called the Iron Roots Podcast, which I highly suggest people go out and listen to. It's on his YouTube channel, and there's about 25-ish episodes and he goes into Bill Peanuts West and into West Side Barbell, the original one, and how in this episode that I'll drop in the sources, Zach goes into how he had sectional training, he called it. And Zach's very training-focused in his historical podcast, which I like. So he quotes and reads from a lot of older magazines and things, which I've been doing in this episode. So to pay a little homage and some respect to Zach Evanesh, he definitely rubbed off on me. But what I'm getting to is Bill Peanuts West, he was using the power rack in these ways that Bob Peoples started to and kind of taking it forward a little bit that, you know, let's see where I fail my lift. Okay, now this is what I need to work on. I'll set the pins at this height. And that's what he meant by sectional training. From there, 1970s power racks, they're in most serious gyms, but they're also just being made locally. So that's where Adam, some of the... Uh, you know, stuff you might have seen was made. And then 1990s, we see a lot of weight stacks and cables and stuff coming in. And that kind of, you know, sets aside some of the power racks. Now, along the way, there have been other things. You know, York had an isometric rack. Or even way, way back in 1959, I have this Iron Man magazine with a wooden squat stand that looks quite a bit like a power rack. I suppose you could really loop the bar in there if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's getting closer, put it that way. So, you know, we have this development going on all the way up until today where we have new companies coming out, like Surplus Strength is starting to make racks. What kind of changes, and we'll close out on this, boys, do you think we've seen in the way that power racks are used based on what you just heard of the history of power racks? I would say even thinking about when I first got into the home gym scene, uh, safety was kind of the primary issue or the primary reason someone would get a power rack within their home gym. And now it's basically a versatility that you're able to add a ton of attachments and create kind of a all in one gym within the footprint of just a power rack. So I would say like just the ability to add a variety of exercises to your, to your setup is 
uh, probably the most, probably the biggest reason people decide to add a power rack nowadays anyways. Yeah, and then like a feature in power racks that's becoming popular is the west side spacing for like mm. getting the bar and the pins exactly where you want it. That seems to be like one of the main reasons that in the development of them, like you said, sectional training or this is where I failed to lift, being able to, to set up at that height and go. Now, I'm not sure if the west side spacing, that may have come from Louis Simmons, not Bill Peanuts West. I'll have to look into it or maybe I'll even reach out to Zach, Evan Ash and C. So to close out, hey, thanks so much to the Stark Center, to Dr. Terry Todd and Jan Todd, to Zach Avanesh, to all these people that have done this hard work and led to this. And as all of you head into your home gyms, whether you have a power rack or not, I hope you're lifting weights, whether they're old, whether they're new, or a combination of the two. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. Head over to Apple. Head over to Spotify. Listen to it again. Why not? It makes for good dinner conversation. This is Rob, Vintage Weights, PGH, Jake and Adam. Take care.